The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 8th chapter of Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 8. We'll begin with verse, excuse me, verse 31 and read to verse 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with the disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when when He comes in the glory of His Father with the holy angels. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God... May we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you have us to do. Lord, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, way back when, and in a former life, when I used to work in an auto shop in my hometown, We would have a handful of guys who would bounce around from shop to shop. They'd work a few months here, maybe a year or two over there, but they never were anywhere too terribly long. There are different reasons why some of them wouldn't stay put. Some of them just never could catch on to the whole, you know, show up to work on time thing. Some of them uh, would just work enough to sort of get caught up on whatever alimony or child support they were behind on, and then thinking that they were caught up enough, they just quit. And then some of them would drink or smoke or fight too much, and well, then there was Joey. Joey's problem was a bit more, let's say, psychological. Joey came to work in the shop after I had been there for a while, But I knew Joey. Everybody knew of Joey. I had seen him at other shops, even at a Toyota dealer once when I was a parts runner. I knew he had a nice toolbox he bought from the Mac Man on credit and often hid in the bathroom when the Mac Man came by to collect. And he always needed help moving it. Every so often, he'd borrow somebody's truck or a trailer and have to move it. Joey had a reputation Uh, in the shops in town of being slow, not a very quick mechanic. He complained a lot, and he was less than reliable. But when help is hard to find, you take what help you can find. And so Joey started working for us and worked a few weeks with the rest of us in this little shop where folks would bring their grandma's rusted-out Oldsmobiles, their overloaded F-100s, and their ragged-out late 80s model Hondas. I'm not saying it was the the top-of-the-line shop, okay? But I remember Joey one day just quit. And as he was pushing his his toolbox up the ramp of somebody's borrowed trailer, we heard him yell at the owner, I'm tired of getting my hands covered with grease, working on all this old nasty junk. And I distinctly remember saying, oh, really? What did you expect? Folks aren't exactly rolling in here on their new Rolls Royces and BMWs and Mercedes, hoping that we'll just change the wiper blades and they'll pay us a couple hundred dollars. This is how we make a living, getting our hands dirty, working on other folks' junk. That's how it works. Joey's primary problem was his expectations 
He had an expectation of what he thought he ought to be doing, what he thought he was worth, but it just didn't line up with reality. A rather obvious reality to the rest of us, I guess. But I suppose I shouldn't be too hard on Joey, though. After all, don't we all sometimes get our expectations out ahead of our reality? Even plain, clearly obvious reality? Now that you mention it, now that I mention it, because you haven't mentioned anything, right? Now that I mention it, I kind of think of that might be what's going on in the passage in front of us. Someone's getting their expectations out ahead of their reality. Mark tells us that Jesus began to teach them, that's the crowd, his disciples, that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed. And after that, three days later, rise again. Now, this isn't Jesus teaching in parables. This is what we call the first of three passion predictions in Mark's gospel. This isn't a parable. This message about suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection isn't another riddle for his followers to figure out. This isn't another puzzle for them to put together, for them to all walk away going, I wonder what he meant by that. No, Mark says that Jesus said all this quite openly. That's what he says, which is quite different from what Mark tells us in chapter 4 and verse 34, where there Jesus did not speak to them except in parables or riddles, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. Not this time. He says it all quite openly. This sudden frankness on the part of Jesus signals to us a shift in the narrative of Mark's gospel. And what's more, that shift comes with what is the first of these passion predictions about his death. Jesus said all of this quite openly, without sugarcoating it, without flowery language, without any parabolic twist. There's no Samaritan healing a man on the side of the road in this story. There's no story. There's no cloudy riddles. In other words, for Jesus, this is reality. The Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and three days rise again. But Peter's expectations are different. And, if we're honest, ours are too. To tell the truth, I know mine are. Because if I'm honest with you, I don't like what Jesus says. I don't like it. I don't like this reality. I don't want a Savior who suffers. That's not what a Savior is supposed to do. A Savior is supposed to be on the other end of suffering, causing it to evildoers, reprobates, fornicators, sinners, all those other folks who are supposed to be doing right and aren't. That's what a Savior is supposed to do, inflict the suffering, not, not be the subject of it. That's what a Savior does. A Savior doesn't get rejected and killed. Are you kidding me? Killed? A Savior doesn't die. He saves. He saves the day. Rides in on a white horse, sword drawn, guns blazing, kicking in the door, taking names. That's what a Savior does. A Savior doesn't die. So it only goes without saying that a Savior who doesn't die has no need of resurrection, so we don't even need to talk about that. A Savior doesn't die. No, I want a Savior who does away with that kind of stuff, who does away with suffering. A Savior who saves me from the pain of rejection and a Savior who can avoid death, so I can too. That's my expectation. That's what I want. I want the kind of Savior Peter declares in the verses right before we show up this morning. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Oh, well, some say you're John. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you might be one of the prophets who are supposed to show up at the end and tell us that the kingdom's coming. And Jesus says, that's all fine. But who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter always steps up. Peter's that kid in class who always raises his hand, who's always got the right answer or sometimes the wrong answer, but he's always the first one. And Peter speaks up, you are the Messiah. Right. That's what I want. 
Really, though, I like the way Matthew tells it a little bit better. Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Did you notice that? Peter knows. Peter knows the kind of Messiah we want, the kind we need. A Messiah not from a dead Savior, but from a living God. I mean, even Jesus, according to Matthew, seems to suggest that Peter's got it right. Well done. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, for it is my father in heaven. And I tell you, you were Peter. You were Simon. Now your name's rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell can't prevail against that. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's good stuff. Heaven and hell. Bind it here. Loose it there. I like that. That's the kind of Savior I want. Peter, right in these words, right before we show up in the gospel, that's what happens. He identifies Jesus as the Messiah. But then, then, Jesus, just as he does so often, shatters our self-centered ambitions and expectations with the whole, the Son of Man must undergo suffering be rejected, killed, all that business. It's no wonder Peter tries to set him straight. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Oh, yeah, but I'm going to be, be rejected and I'm going to be killed and I'm going to have to suffer. It's no wonder that Peter puts his arms around Jesus' shoulders and says, come over here, Jesus, I got to tell you something. I got to set you straight, man. That's not what you said. That's not how it's going to go. The Bible says it's going to be this way. I'm going to set you straight, Jesus. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Of course he did. I'd do the same thing, and you would too. Don't lie to yourself. You'd have pulled Jesus aside and said, that ain't what we talked about, Jesus. That's not the way it's supposed to go. You're the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for, the one to deliver us from Roman oppression, the promised one of God. And now, now you're going to tell me that you must suffer and be rejected and die. That's crazy. I'm not buying it, Jesus. They didn't sign up for this. The disciples didn't sign up for all this suffering, rejection, and death. Of course, if I'm honest, I didn't sign up for it either. I was 18 when I felt the waters of baptism wash over me. I'd been going to church pretty regularly for a few months, listening to sermons about how much of an awful sinner I was, how hot hell was going to be for those folks who didn't say the sinner's prayer before they died. I'd read the King James Bible the church had given me for my high school graduation, tracts that illustrated what the great white throne judgment was going to be like, and I'd read some of the Left Behind books. I was ready. I knew hell was a place I didn't want to be, and heaven sounded pretty good. I mean, mansions? Gold streets, you grow up in a double wide mansion in a gold street, sounds pretty good. Of course, for me, for me, it was the love of God. A God whose love had rescued me from all of that literal damnation by sacrificing his son to seal the deal. I was told all I have to do is just pray this sin. I don't even have to pray it, just bow my head, close my eyes, the preacher say it for me. Walk the aisle. Tell the church, get baptized, then I'd be set for heaven, no longer bound for the deep, dark fires of hell. So that's what I did. That's what I signed up for. Get out of hell, get into heaven. Because that's the kind of Messiah I wanted. The kind that gets me into the exclusive eternal home that is heaven. But of course, Jesus... Oh, Jesus, as he so often does, shatters my self-centered ambitions and expectations with, well, just about everything he says. Especially these verses he says in this passage after he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. He turns to the crowd and says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. Those who want to lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Did you all read that? Did you all hear me say that? That doesn't make sense. 
I want to be a follower of Jesus. If I want to be a follower of Jesus, if I want to go to heaven, if I want to be a Christian, I got to deny myself, lose my life. I thought I thought I just had to agree to a few fundamental plot points. Pray this prayer about confessing my sins, repenting and accepting Jesus into my heart, which, by the way, is like that language is nowhere in the Bible. I thought I was supposed to get baptized all the way under, you know, not just a little sprinkling on the head, but all the way under the right way. Come to church on Sunday, read my Bible, drink sweet tea and not beer, stay out of trouble. I thought that's all I had to do to be a Christian, to get into heaven. It was simple. But now, now, these red letters, Jesus tells me I have to deny myself, give up my life, all that I am, take up my cross, an instrument of death, a message that can be so troubling to folks, especially religious folks, they can get you kicked out or kicked under. And follow him? But, but do y'all know where Jesus is going? It ain't heaven. I've read the Bible. He's going to die. He's going to die. I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for the harp and the crown, the mansion over the hilltop, the sweet by and by, Beulah land. I didn't sign up for a cross, for death, for self-sacrifice. I didn't sign up for that. That's not what I wrote my name down on the card for. But you know, it's hard to sell that kind of gospel. It really is. Folks don't really line up when you start talking about that. In fact, when it came real for Jesus, they all just sort of left. Really, it's hard to get folks to sign up to die, to give away all that they have, to live their lives for somebody besides themselves. It's hard. Why, it's a whole lot easier to get folks to buy in if there's something in it for them, some prize at the end, a reward that makes it all worth it. Why, if you can tell them to be a good person, to love their neighbor, because that's how they get jewels and their crown in heaven, they'll listen. They'll line up. That's how you get the bigger mansion around the corner from Jesus. If you can tell them that God will bless them with material wealth here and now, that'll get them to sign up. Promise them the world in return for their faithfulness. But Jesus says, what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Could it be, could it be, that when we seek faith, religion, church, whatever you want to call it, when we seek faith as a way to have more, as a way to have a better life, that what we long for is a better life and not God. Could it be that when our ultimate reason for following Jesus is to go to heaven, that what we long for is heaven and not Jesus? I know it's a hard way to think about it. I know you're not trying to gain the whole world, but maybe, maybe just maybe you've been eyeballing a little corner lot in heaven somewhere. I don't know. Did you notice how Jesus didn't even mention that sort of thing in this exchange? He doesn't say, if anybody wants to go to heaven, line up. No, no. If any want to become my followers. Followers of Jesus, those who long to live in the way of Jesus, those who learn from Jesus, who seek to live and love like Jesus, to carry on in the here and now in the reality of self-sacrifice that can lead even to death like Jesus. You know, that kind of selflessness is not fashionable today, especially not in our culture. No, no, you've got to be strong. Look out for you and yours first. You can't just let folks take advantage of you because, you know, they will. Open yourself up and somebody will take everything you got. Lay down and they'll walk all over you. You can't be that way. You got to have your guard up. You got to be ready. You got to be prepared. You got to be suspicious of everybody. You can't just lay down. Why, a person can develop a reputation. Be naive. Gullible. A pushover. Weak. 
Why, it would almost be enough to be ashamed of. But I think Jesus said something about that too, didn't he? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation. Those who are ashamed of me and the selfless gospel that I preach. Those who are ashamed of me and the fact that I'm not some mega, super, untouchable God, but a Savior who dies. Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful, self-centered generation of them. The Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus said, If anyone wants to be my follower, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. If a life full of good times, pleasure, and happiness is what you want, friends, I honestly pray that is what you get. I really do. If a mansion on a gold-paved street is what you hope for, I hope that's what we all get. I really do. But if you want to follow Jesus, be ready. Be ready to follow him down paths that may lead to suffering, down roads that only bring rejection, Be ready to, as the psalmist says in the old King James, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because if you truly want to follow Jesus, then I pray you begin this day, that we all begin today to give up more and more of ourselves. To stop seeing the world through the limited lenses of self-preservation. To take up our cross, though deadly it is, And follow the one who calls us into the truest reality of life. A life lived, losing to save. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God giver of the Holy Spirit. God, help us who call ourselves your followers to heed your words this day. That if we truly wish to be your follower, we begin even in this moment to deny ourselves, to let go of who we are, to let go of what we think we ought to be, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross. It's painful, treacherous, and deadly though it may be. And Lord, give us the strength to follow you. To know that you lead us to glory. But Lord, on the way, we don't get to skip all the pain and the suffering. And help us to realize you are a Savior who is beyond our expectations. Leads us even through the dark corners of life. And that you are here with us now calling us to let go of more and more of who we are. That we may pick up and take on more and more of who you are and who you call us to be. Move in our presence, Holy Spirit. We pray in the power of the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.